Hi everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me today. I wasn't absolutely sure I wanted to do a video because people are still digesting Biden's State of the Union, but I've got so many interesting sets of pictures for you, so I thought I'd do it anyway, including Putin. How does he feel now that Trump is on the slide and his fortunes are waning? Is there still a bond there? I took a look at that. Plus, how did Mike Johnson feel during the State of the Union? Union. He didn't seem very happy, but I thought we could go into his consciousness live during this video and see how he was really feeling. Also, that guy Mark Robinson, who wants to be the governor of North Carolina and won the Republican nomination there this week. Quite a horrible man on the face of it, but I thought I'd take a look and see what his chances are of getting the job in November. Also, Larry Hogan, the former governor of Maryland. He is a fairly reasonable Republican in many ways. And now he's running for a U.S. Senate seat in Maryland. So I thought I'd take a look at him. I told you it was a busy week. Uh, so I took a look at him as well, plus a whole bunch more. Joe Biden's feisty State of the Union speech on Thursday night was definitely a high point in his campaign for re-election. But the event brought an absolute disaster for the Republicans in the shape of Katie Britt, the junior senator from Alabama, an otherwise very intelligent and accomplished woman. Actually, Trump loves her, says she's a great America first warrior, but really she disgraced herself on Thursday night. That creepy, weepy delivery she had, as if she was auditioning for a walk-on part in Days of Our Lives. <laughs> <laughs> and that terrible kitchen setting as well, which endorses the idea that many Republicans have that women need to get back in the kitchen, back in the home where they belong, which is right on the money. Hey, eh, ladies? <laughs> It was a disaster all round. In fact, you know what we could do? I wonder if I could do this right now. Go into Katie Britt's consciousness and see how this has all impacted her. I wonder if I can do this right now. Okay, here we go. This was unplanned, but let's give it a go. Katie Britt, how is she feeling? Uh, you know, pogo sticks? You remember pogo sticks from way back in the 60s and 70s? People used to have them. They were like skateboards, only they were vertical. <laughs> um, she was on one of those. Boing. You know, you just jump up and down. Boing, 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 boing. Going forward. She must have been really excited by this. She must have seen it as a massive opportunity. In fact, as she's going along, boing, boing, there is an enormous, bright and beaming light in her eyes. I think she's on the shortlist for Trump's VP slot. She wants to be his running mate. Uh, she's very, very Trumpian. And this bright light suggests this is going to be her big break. This is where she becomes a national figure, uh, which is true. <laughs> uh, if only she'd known. Um, so the bright light is there. Boing, boing. Very springy. Very... Oh! <laughs> um, <laughs> the light... Yes, the light is shining on her, but it's on the front of a locomotive that's coming right at her. This will be the media attention, I assume. Oh my God, that is so bright and it's hurtling right toward... Oh, she she gets on a pogo stick and she... Boing, 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 back here. <laughs> she suddenly sees this coming towards her and she wants to get out of the way of it. And there, there, there is a little... Uh, what do they call them? Uh, service tunnels. You know service tunnels that they have in railways, underground railways, so that workmen can hide in them when the trains go by? That kind of thing. She goes and hides in one of those, and the train goes by this way, and she slumps inside this service tunnel. She must be feeling terrible. This is going to be a humiliating downturn in her life. This could have ruined her chances of becoming Trump's VP ever. Oh, which is such a shame. She's built up this reputation for being pretty savvy. Oh, poor Katie Britt. I feel sorry for her now. 
Uh, remember that guy I was following in Ohio, Jay Armajewski? He was my bellwether MAGA candidate. I'm basically not following every race this time around. I'm just getting bellwether candidates who might give an idea to us of how the parties might go. And Jay Armajewski was my bellwether MAGA candidate. He dropped out because he'd made some inadvisable comments about the Special Olympics. <laughs> so now I don't have a bellwether MAGA MAGA candidate. I was considering CC Truman in California. She's a big Trump person and she's running for the US House of Representatives. I did her pictures and she had a huge job ahead of her to get anywhere. Remember she was climbing that cliff only she was doing it on her elbows which is always the wrong way to go. Uh, some of you were a little snarky and said that it's because she didn't want to break her fingernails. <laughs> Whatever the reason she wasn't doing it with all her potential energy. And right now, I don't think the results are announced until April, actually. But right now, she's doing fairly well. She's third with a 56% vote count, I think. But she is a fairly distant third behind the Democrat. And according to the pictures, is unlikely to win. So she can't be my bellwether. Then I discovered this guy, as the rest of the world did, called Mark Robinson. He is currently the Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina and is running for the gubernatorial position. He got the Republican nomination on Super Tuesday and suddenly the social media outlets were flooded with things he'd said in the past that were derogatory about gay people, about Muslims, about Jews. Uh, he is, on the face of it, a pretty despicable guy. And another one of those, like Tom Woods last time, who calls gay people filth and worse than something that a pig might excrete or something like that. So not, but obviously a Christian. So uh, I thought I would take a look at him. His race for the governorship is against a guy called Josh Stein, the Democrat. And I thought it wouldn't hurt me right now to put the two of them side by side and see what happens to this guy, Mark Robinson. And when I did, there they are, side by side, Mark Robinson was coming down a hillside, but on rolling logs. Nothing was terribly stable. It was very much a kind of whoa, 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 constant balancing act to stay upright. I guess his history of derogatory comments came back to haunt him, and he's saying, no, those are media lies. I didn't mean that. They're twisting my words and so on. It felt incredibly chaotic. But he was coming precariously down this hillside, trying to stay upright, uh, 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 watched by, from a distance, Josh Stein, who right now is the Attorney General for North Carolina, and seemed, in the pictures anyway, a pretty stable influence. At the bottom of the hill, Mark Robinson hit a wall. It all came to an end. That could be Super Tuesday. All this chaos ended because now he was the Republican nominee. Josh Stein walks on, and it became pretty obvious that he was on a higher level, and Mark Robinson was on a lower level, probably because of his reputation and of his foul views. Josh Stein stayed on this higher level, and Mark Robinson became very agitated. He was sort of throwing himself uh, Josh Stein, making points, making accusations, trying to get his attention and throw him off his game. He did this a couple of times, actually, threw himself at the path that Josh Stein was on, obviously feeling like he, Mark Robinson, was the lesser of the two candidates. And at some point, the paths diverged. Mark Robinson's went down, and Josh Stein's continued on into the distance. We'll come back to Mark Robinson in a moment, because Josh Stein's pictures were really interesting at this point. Ahead of him was a set of hills, 
And hills usually mean the end of the year, and that's when the election is, so I assume that's what that means. And behind the hills, the sun was going down. This was somewhat troubling, because when the sun goes down behind hills, it usually means the end of something, uh, a sunset, you know, the end of the day. It felt like he was going to fail, like this would be the end of his run. As he approached the hills, though, he discovered that they weren't real and the sunset wasn't real. Maybe there was an atmosphere of doom and gloom around the election, like, oh, the Democrats aren't going to win or I'm not going to win or it's going to go horribly wrong and this will be the end for me. But he got there and he found that this was fake news, literally fake news because it was just flat. And furthermore, if he scratched at the backdrop and pulled, it came away to form a doorway. Doorways usually mean opportunity. He stepped through into a narrow alleyway between the backdrop and a wall, so there's no way of going forward. The door that he was meant to go through, another doorway, another opportunity, was up above him. Maybe there's some kind of contest about the actual results that's possible, or maybe there's a delay before he actually takes office. But it did feel like he was elevated. All he had to do was just wait, and he gradually rose until he was at the level of the doorway and could walk through. That's good news for him. I don't do winning or losing in races, but that did suggest that he might prevail. Then I went back to look for Mark Robinson. He obviously had gone off on his own little path. And when I found him, he was walking down a steep hill. It got darker and darker and darker. And he had his head in his hands actually. And at some point he stopped in the darkness where nobody could see him crying and just felt terrible. Uh, he might even have a moment of redemption at that point. Like, what was I thinking saying these things? Or why did I take these attitudes? I mean, you hope, but it did seem as though there was an element of that within him. Uh, if his ego could get out of the way. Because if you're the kind of person who has no compassion for others, no kindness, no ability to embrace those who are different from yourself, then you're not really a Christian. You're just an ideologue and a bigot, really. And maybe he comes to appreciate uh, aspects of that, given the publicity. Um, but he was down there crying. So I would say that he doesn't make it. And that's my feeling generally. He's another MAGA guy who doesn't make it. This is looking good for keeping these people at bay. But of course, you've got people like Speaker of the House Mike Johnson promoting a similar kind of backward ideology in the name of Jesus. Something that he would not have approved of in the first place. And during the State of the Union speech... When Joe Biden was making simple points about embracing people and showing kindness to people and empathy and so on, Mike Johnson just sat in the back shaking his head with exasperation that Biden was scoring all these points. And I thought at the time, I wonder what's going through his mind as he sits there, this little elfin figure shaking his head. And I thought I could do that now and uh, go into the energy of Mike Johnson at the State of the Union and see what he was going through. Let's take a look. If this gets boring, I'll edit it. Um, hang on. Mike Johnson in that picture. Oh, I, I, I was expecting to look out on a sea of faces, but no. He, what? He, sitting in a canoe. He's in a canoe. What? He's in a canoe, 
sailing or whatever you do, uh, rowing against the current of the river. He's in a river and he's uh, paddling against the current. The gradient of the river is like really steep. It's coming at him very, very strong. Uh, well, you see, that probably means that he felt like he was uh, fighting a losing battle here. Uh, and he keeps on paddling furiously. That's what's going on in his mind. It's like, oh my God, all these obstacles we have to get past. I don't know if we're going to make it. Paddle, 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 splash, splash. The river... Uh, shape it's a bit like the roof of a tesla cyber truck it goes up like that and then over gotta get past this gotta get past this oh my god we're losing we're losing he must have a real sense that the republicans are on a downward spiral here um and paddle 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 goes to the top no, the river doesn't go down. I take that back. It doesn't go down. It's like a huge volcanic crater. Uh, maybe the party craters. <laughs> but it's a huge uh, volcanic crater with a little lake at the bottom. And he goes over the edge. And it's just rocks. There's no water. And he goes... <laughs> all the way down to the bottom and splash into the water. Either he loses his job. Because... Republicans think he's not achieving what they need him to achieve to support Donald Trump, or, or it's just a loss at the election. But it's really hard going down the other side on rocks in a canoe. Yeah, so it looks like it's not going to be an easy time. And Mike Johnson, as he was listening to Joe Biden give his speech was thinking, we are not winning this battle. We are not going to succeed unless we do something pretty radical to counteract this. I did a muscle test a while ago for whether Donald Trump would win the election. We could do it again now. Let's just see what happens. Donald Trump wins the election in November. No, that's what I got last time as well. Joe Biden wins the election in November. Lovely. Luckily, the MAGA cause does seem to be slipping away, albeit slowly, and more reasonable conservatives are drifting in, hoping to get a seat in Congress. One of those is Larry Hogan. He used to be the governor of Maryland and was pretty successful at it, I think. He left office with a 77% approval rating. He's a strange mix, actually, of liberal and conservative. He said he won't vote for Trump. In the election, for instance, he is pro-gay marriage, pro-marijuana legalization, but anti-abortion, and I believe a climate science denier. So he's that kind of weird mix, but it does hint at compromise. And many people are thinking, well, he's a great guy. He's an articulate guy. He's very bright and stands up for good things sometimes. So maybe he would be good in the Senate. Uh, he is running for the Senate seat in uh, Maryland. And I thought I would take a look at him and see how far he might go. And when I went into his energy, there he is. At first, he was yawning, uh, suggesting that he was a little bored with his life, like he craves political office. He announced that he was running for the U.S. Senate last month, I think. So it's very, very recent. But immediately after the yawning, he began marching like somebody in a parade. He was up and down, up and down, very bouncy. He had got himself on a path. And this path went into the distance, but it had a kind of pivot or joint in the middle. I wasn't sure why at first. What happened was he was walking along the path and suddenly it jolted to the left, taking him by surprise. Something happened that made him recalculate his future or reconsider his prospects or retool his campaign, something like that. He walked along and had to make an adjustment to go forward. But if he carried on going, 
there was a challenge, there was a set of steps he had to climb, something he had to do. Then it made another turn. This is all to the left, by the way, and left usually means something new, something different, heading in a good direction. He went up the steps, made a left up a passageway, and at the end of the passageway, there was a door that was emitting bright light, bright daylight. And uh, that seemed like a good thing for him. It's actually very likely right now that he could take that job. That would put another Republican in the Senate, which a lot of Democrats don't want, but he's somebody you could reason with on a lot of issues and uh, is anti-Trump, anti-MAGA. So he might bring a certain amount of reason and balance and common sense to the Senate. Because I think people generally around the country are getting ultra tired of living in a state of apprehension and worry and fear and uh, of division and people attacking everybody. They don't like that anymore. It's getting very, very old. Now, obviously, in the world, there are a lot of things to be concerned about. The Russia-Ukraine situation. Will Russia advance and go into Poland, etc.? And the situation in Israel. Uh, Netanyahu's relentless and merciless attacks on Gaza. These things are major concern. In fact, there was that guy... He was called Aaron Bushnell. Remember, he's 25, uh, some kind of Air Force guy. And he went to Washington, D.C., stood in front of the Israeli embassy there and set himself on fire. I will spare you that photo. It's just horrible. But as he was on fire, he kept yelling, free Palestine, free Palestine. And he died later of his burns in hospital. It was absolutely horrific. And I thought at the time, I wonder what's going through his head as he does that. Because some people say, well, that's a foolish move. You'd be better uh, voicing your protests when you're alive than when you're dead. Uh, and others said, wow, like Hamas actually congratulated him and said, what a guy, and so on. And I thought, I wonder what's going on in Aaron Bushnell's head. Apparently, he had no mental issues. He was just very fervently um, anti-Israel in this conflict. And uh, when I went into his energy, it was like there were spears coming at me from every direction. And I felt I couldn't move. There was just too much for me to deal with. In fact, I looked up and there was a freeway or highway on stilts or something above me, suggesting that I was powerless, knowing that certain things needed to be done, certain steps needed to be taken, and you were too small to impact the outcome. And I guess this was a cry for for mercy, for understanding, and so on. And this was the way he chose to do it. It felt like powerlessness against so many issues that affected him at a very, very profound level. That's what that felt like. That's what powerlessness, which is probably the lowest vibration state you could ever be in, that's what powerlessness can do. It can drive people to uh, extreme lengths uh, simply to feel significant, like they're making an impact. And speaking of people's consciousness, I seem to have done that a lot today. Uh, I took a quick look at Putin's consciousness again, just to see what his state of mind is currently. And when I did, there was a lake, I suppose it was, like a lake. And I could see the top of his head sticking out of the water as he moved, a bit shark-like, as he moved through the water. Underneath, though, it was very, very dark. And I felt like I had grit hitting me in the eyes the whole time. I didn't know what I was doing, really. I didn't know where I was going. It was just awkward and dangerous. Everything was a struggle. He must be in the dark every single day. And maybe this is his radar <laughs> that tells him where to go in the lake. Otherwise, without that, he's pretty clueless. And eventually, he hits a little piece of land and starts crawling out of the lake. But this is the weird thing. Because 
you know, that dome that he had, the top of his head. When he emerged, that's all that was left. The water he'd been in, the lake, the conditions... Uh, the state of anger and resentment and low consciousness things he'd lived through had eroded his spirit, his body even, his soul. He was corroded by circumstance. And when he emerged, he was just dripping with what seemed like acid water. This is what's left of me. This is what you don't get to see. Allow me to show it to you. Not good pictures at all. But of course, finally, it got me to thinking, I wonder how he feels about Trump now. If Putin is slowly diminishing and on his way out, what does he feel about Trump, whose fortunes are sliding all the time. And in actual fact, when I put them side by side, there they are, Putin was on the top of a little hill and Trump was doing just that. He was sliding, trying to hang on to the level that Putin was at. Come on, Vlad, please support me. Come on. But the ground, as so often happens in Trump's pictures, was subsiding. It was falling away and he was going with it. Putin simply watched him go. There was no real connection there. Trump was, I felt in these pictures, genuinely a useful idiot in Putin's plans. There was not the kind of camaraderie between them that Trump's always boasting about, and maybe even believes exists. Uh, Trump slid down with the subsiding hillside, and there was some kind of concrete canopy at the bottom, uh, self-supporting. There was nothing to hold it up, really. And Trump went right under there. There was no room for manoeuvre. It was dark. It was cramped. And if he tried to stand up, he banged his head on the concrete. All he could do was crawl along in this confined space and hope for the best, which is very much his MO in life, really. But towards the end, the ground became gravelly and once again started to subside. He had no choice. He just went with it and slid and slid and slid pretty much echoing all the other pictures that I have done for Trump. Remember the one where he was supported by the wires and uh, the boardwalk under him was crumbling all the time. That's in the previous two videos at some point, so you might want to go and check that out. But the boardwalk was crumbling under him. There was only his backers, his dark money people, who were holding him together and stopping him from falling. And this was pretty much true. It does look as though Putin is at the end of his tether with Trump and uh, doesn't see him as somebody who will prevail in November. Trump prevails in November. There you go. Well, that's all I got. I've actually got to go and wash my sweater, clearly. <laughs> but thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. It's goodbye from him. And uh, it's goodbye from me. See you soon, guys. Bye-bye.